Who was Vespasian? What makes him so interesting? And where does history meet fiction? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today's episode is with Robert Fabry, author of the best-selling Vespasian series. We discuss the emperor himself, the world of ancient Rome, and the power of historical writers. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. Now, on to the first century AD and the Emperor Vespasian. Now, you have been writing uh, historical fiction about Roman history and in particular about Vespasian, the Roman emperor. Um, Why this specific Roman emperor and sort of what time period of his life do you cover? Well, Vespasian for me was a a very, very simple choice. Um, He uh, was born in the time of Augustus and he basically survives every Roman emperor up until the year of the four emperors in 69 and then he comes out on top and remains emperor for almost 10 years. The best thing about Vespasian is that he served in so many parts of the empire. Um, So he was um, uh, in Thrace, probably not at the time of the Thracian revolt, probably arrived just afterward but I know, it's no, it's no fun just arriving just after a revolt. So I fit him in towards the end. Uh, he was in Africa. Uh, he was uh, in um, Germania. He was in Britannia. Uh, he was um, basically in uh, Judea. He was in, he was in all, o- all over the Roman Empire, with the exception of Hispania. Uh, so, and that was throughout his life. So I, I realised if I took Vespasian, then the backdrop of each book would be different. It's not just always going to be Rome and, you know, uh, a province. It's, it's going to be Rome and different provinces all the time. So you can meet different peoples, different situations, and explore the history of Rome in the first century through somebody who was actually present at quite a lot of, um, of, um, of the great events. And yes, um, to ask your second question, I take him from birth to death. Uh, so, oh, you go the whole of his life, because um, oh, he, yeah. I guess, unlike a lot of emperors, had a, a bit of a different background, uh, wealth, social, economically speaking. Yeah, I mean, he was a new man, so he basically came from um, the Sabine Hills. He, uh, he to the end of his life, um, he, uh, he had a, a Sabine burr in his accent, you know, it's sort of, you know, like speaking strong Yorkshire all your life, um, even though you're in power. So uh, he didn't care. He was proud of his accent. He was proud of his, of his roots. Um, and uh, yes, he, um, uh, I take him from his birth. Uh, well, at least, not, not quite from his birth. That's, a, that's, that's not quite true. It's about nine days after his birth. Um, well, I take him from his naming ceremony. Um, and then right through to, to his death. Um, I skip, you know, bits and pieces, but um, yeah, basically is, um, uh, the main part of his life is covered. It must be different be- to be a historical fiction writer than, say, an academic, because I would say in our listeners, in our crowd, we sort of uh, span the two easily. We've, we've got students, we've got amateur um, academics, and we have people who just have the passion and interest in the, in the classics. Do, do you think you experience the history different by doing, coming at it from a sort of a historical fiction writer rather than an academic standpoint? Yes, because um, with an academic, I think um, the whole point is to find, uh, to find the truth, uh, to find you know, what, you know, the solid historical facts argued and things, which is always very difficult. To, I mean, I did history 
uh, in, I'm not ancient, uh, medieval history for A-level. And, uh, you know, so you're writing your essays and, you know, he, he did this because of that, but this happened because of that. And, you know, that, yeah, it's, and it's just finding sort of some sort of, you know, sort of truth that you think that you can present to everyone and say, this is how it happened. Well, with, with, um, with writing historical fiction, uh, I mean, the main uh, two words are historical and fiction. So you, you automatically you have license. Um, I take what are the perceived historical facts, uh, which again may not be. I mean, for example, I mean, Suetonius um, uh, wrote his histories of uh, yeah, the other Caesars. Uh, and it could actually, it is argued that it's a massive bit of propaganda, sort of dissing, you know, Nero, Claudius, and Caligula, and uh, well, yeah, you know, just to just to make, um, you know, Vespasian and Domitian, uh, you know, the the the, the new um, the, the new dynasty look good. So who knows? But I take those uh, take that to the uh, take uh, them as the historical facts, and uh, and then I. I, I weave my tail between it and between them, and uh, so that it's like I always say it's like joining the dots. Writing, you know where you start, you know where you want to end, you know a couple of places in the middle, and you've got to make it a good story. You know, rollicking good um, sword and sandals, um, and, but with uh, you know within the terms of the history that we know and understand. So you're not writing a fantasy. Rome, you're writing real Rome. This is Rome, how it was, how you see it, um, and uh, making it as um, making it as entertaining as possible, as thrilling as possible, with everything that's going on, all the machinations of you know whether it be um, you know Claudius's freedmen, Narcissus and Pallas and uh, Callistus, or you know wh wh whether it be Vespasian's uh, you know, family with his brother, we. We, we, we know certain things about uh, his uncle that we know certain things about, his mistress, kindness, or his wife, Flavia, making, making it all work within the terms of everything that we know, and yet the whole thing's fiction. Because who knows actually how Vespasian's life went. And, uh, you know, I, I just come up with good reasons why he did such and such a thing or why he was there. Um, so... The answer is, the short answer is, yes, I have far more license. I could never write history. I'd probably end up making it all up um, because uh, <laughs> my imagination is just, it's, 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 it's too wild to be an historian. Well, I mean, if you think about it, Thucydides wrote as, as historically accurate as he felt, but he, he relays speeches and conversations that obviously he was not really privy to uh, yeah. really what's the difference in, in in way when you think about it because uh, he's trying to fill out those gaps and find the motivations and maybe takes a little bit of what he's heard here or there but you know pericles speech is not pericles speech no no i mean that, that was the convention of the time tacitus does exactly the same thing i mean he doesn't he hasn't got a clue what certain people said at a certain time but he knows roughly what, well, what they were trying to say and he'd say he writes a nice big long flowery speech and it's all it's all very good and everyone understands at the time they would have understood that that is not actually what was said but that was the essence of what was said and uh, and uh, a, a nice way of uh, presenting it and, and, and bravo test is very very good very good <laughs> i guess i guess for me the difficulty would be trying to understand the motivations within the ancient roman context because I think some of the actions may not be as relatable to us today because we sort of have our modern mindset and social expectations and things. And, you know, I was talking to a fellow the other day about, you know, the wrath of Achilles, for instance, and, he, and he's like, why is he so angry? And like, well, if you think about it in the ancient Greek mindset, he's probably not actually that angry, you know, compared to, say, Obviously, Hector was less angry, but Ajax was a lot more angry, you know. <laughs> My point is, is that from our mindset, we're like, whoa, that's, that's an insane thing to do. But maybe in the ancient world, that, that made a lot more sense. So for you, do you have to try to go into the motivations of the ancient Romans? Or do you try to think of the motivations that would make sense to your readers? 
Uh, no, I mean, uh, I, I try and dispense with all Judeo-Christian uh, morality um, and try and put myself back in um, the most competitive society of, uh, that was ancient Rome. Um, I've got no interest in making my characters um, uh, unrealistically modern. Vespasian is out for himself. Um, yes, he does have the odd bit of uh, empathy here and there, uh, and he's got uh, people around him who've got who have even less, if if anything, no empathy. To, uh, they are they are Romans. They are um, they are family orientated. They are there for survival. There's no such thing as welfare in those days. You know, it's, you, you either claw yourself to the top or you die trying or you end up uh, dying in a gutter, um, especially for that um, for that uh, generation, uh, for that, oh, sorry, uh, that class, the equites. I mean, yeah, your money could be lost at any time. Uh, no such thing as insurance, nothing. It's, it's, it's bloody, bloody hard living and surviving in those terms. It's even harder if you're part of the headcount. Um, but... Um, um, you know, which is which is why I actually have uh, Vespasian's great mate Magnus, who's the leader of the South Quirinal Crossroads Brotherhood, um, uh, as as a foil. So with Magnus, I can actually look down and see what it's like, read even further beneath uh, Vespasian, places where Vespasian would not go. Um, and I used I, I, I do those in the Magnus short stories. Um, a, a hard uh, cover of which are gonna, is going to be out in November. All six Magnus short stories, if you're interested. <laughs> um, sorry, I just get that one in. Um, anyway, um, so yes, he's Vespasian is, 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 is as real uh, a Roman as as I can make him. Um, as I, you know, uh, and I dare to make him. I hope. Towards the end, and this is this sounds a bit awful, awful for me to say. It, I hope he comes across in modern terms as really quite disagreeable. You know, and if I've done that, then I've done my job properly. Because if we were to meet uh, if, uh, your, your average Roman today, you would hate him. You would hate his attitudes. You would hate, you know, the way he thought and things like that. And so, you know, when I, I, I sometimes I despair when I read when I, when I read some, you know, um, Roman fiction or Greek, um, and you've got and it's got these very sounding modern characters who actually care about, you know, people and you know, you know, someone who actually, I mean, it's just it's just wrong. So why do, why should the reader care about your emperor then if he's not a likable guy? Like, what drives well, them he, to he, want to he, learn more in, about him? In Roman terms, he is. You see, I mean, the characters that he's he's up against. I mean, yeah, he's he, he's got to deal with Caligula. I mean, yeah, he's that, that's that's hard work in itself. Um, although I paint a slightly more um, sympathetic version of Caligula, in that I have a lot of a, a, a lot of his uh, motivation is due to the Senate's uh, tacit um, uh, compliance with the. Um, extermination of almost his entire family which is what he so what i have him doing is punishing the senate in return he's not necessarily mad uh this is just a, this is just a long term uh a long term revenge which he embarks upon um and yes he does get a bit too far uh you know then you 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 have you have um claudius friedman who who, who Completely out for themselves, you know. Vespasian, but Vespasian somehow manoeuvres his way around it, and you know, comes out looking much better than they do. But it's all relative. It's all relative. Um, you know, and uh, I, I, I mean, personally, I find him a very likable person. But, uh, um, but perhaps I've been living in first century Rome slightly too long. <laughs> So in your research, was there something that really shocked you or surprised you about the time period or about any of your characters that you were like, wow, I didn't know that at all? Well, you, you, most of it you just can't make up. <laughs> you, know, <we> just, <laughs> you just can't make it up. I mean, uh, uh, I, 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 after a very short time, I, I ceased being surprised. Um, you know, um, about 
what was going on, why, and oh, I don't know. Uh, what is what is shocking? What what what, what did shock me? Um, God. I mean, I quite like I quite like the old Caligula story of um, <laughs> in the uh, uh, in the um, uh, it, it was so yeah it was it was a circus purpose built on the campus marshes and um, anyway the crowd were playing up and um, they weren't behaving and yeah I, I, I think it was some issue about them not treating him with respect to the god and he just goes. You see that bald head to that bald head, throw him in. <laughs> the Praetorium going around there, go, all these free free people, you know, free born or freed people, that, and just chucked them into the into the, into the arena and um, you know let the lions in. I mean, <laughs> that's it, it, that's how arbitrary life is, you know, in in, in those days. Um, yeah, I mean, when you know, you don't really, you're not really shocked by that. But when you actually think, oh my God, you know, even for a Roman, that is pretty, pretty shocking. Yeah, I guess it gives you a bit of perspective on your own life at times. The uh, yeah, really, security yeah. that we have, you know, we're like stressing out because we're going to be late to a meeting. But like, hey, we're not going to be thrown into the lions. Like, <laughs> we're not going to be thrown into the lions. No, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I guess the next question is, uh, historical fiction writers just have so much power over how their characters are determined and whether you like them or not. And I would say probably the most arguably famous is Robert Graves' um, I, Claudius, that, you know, here was an emperor that nobody really cared that much about. And then afterwards, he kind of was given a new happy light. Um, yeah, but, he was fictionalized. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But like, for instance, um, uh, we have a Classical Wisdom magazine and we did a whole issue sort of dedicated to the Julian Claudian dynasty. And in it, we have a, a whole article about Grappina, how maybe wow. she was sort of unjustly uh, written as this sort of incestuous, poisoning, you know, malicious character. But that, you know, in that time period, it was very easy to say somebody was a poisoner or incestual without having any proof and that it was a common political tactic to, to defame somebody uh, if you wanted to. And that if you look at some of the records that, you know, there were actually less assassinations during the time period when she was exerting control over Claudius and that he actually was maybe a bit more violent when she wasn't around. Um, oh, yeah, he, he executed um, more of the upper classes than uh, than Caligula did. Yeah, so so you, yeah. I mean, you you have quite a lot of power. How do you sort of choose how to denote people? And I guess also by extension, how do you feel about Claudius and Agrippina? Well, I, I mean, by by Roman in Roman terms, Agrippina was incestuous in that um, she was Cla uh, Claudius's niece, and it was not really done to marry a niece. So that was seen as incest. So uh, that really isn't um, an accusation that can uh, be refuted. As to her, um, I mean, she. Um, again, had most of her siblings um, uh, killed. Um, she was a survivor. She um, had a son, um, Nero. She married her uncle for one reason, one reason alone, to secure her and her son's future. Uh, there was, of course, somebody in the way, Britannicus, Claudius' uh, own natural son, um, and uh, his end came fairly soon after Claudius's. Claudius, whether he was poisoned with mushrooms or whatever, um, or with, with the feather from the doctor as he tried to uh, uh, get the first lot of mushrooms out, which the poison hadn't completely worked. I don't know. I mean... Where I stand with all that is that's how it's reported. 
I would say that in terms of Agrippina, she is a pretty pretty much straightforward, uh, high class woman uh, in Roman terms. Uh, we find her unacceptable because of our um, moral baggage. Um, Romans found her very difficult to deal with because uh, she was a very powerful woman, uh, personality wise. Uh, not that they minded that so much, but that what they did mind um, was when um, a, a powerful woman uh, tried to inveigle her way into what was seen as uh, being a male preserve, uh, i.e. the uh, governance of the empire. Um, fine to do it from behind the scenes, but actually to start sitting yourself, wanting to sit yourself on the dais next to the emperor and doing all that sort of thing was seen as a bit, as a bit too much. Um, so, um, I mean, I think, um, I think basically we're, um, you know, we, we come from Messalina to Agrippina and we have a series of disastrous, you know, disastrous um, wives for Claudius who I can never quite understand how Robert Graves does his sort of bumbling old man um, thing, which is, which is, yeah, which is fine, you know, because he was an intellectual. He, you know, he was a pedant as well. He, you know, he wanted to put uh, three new letters of the alphabet in. Um, he wrote his history of the Etruscans. He did all sorts of, you know, very good things. Um, he also laughed at his own jokes a lot. He was inordinately uh, excited with the sight of blood. Um, he wasn't. He, he, Robert Graves portrays a half of him. Uh, I think. Um, uh, you know, in the valley half, but I, I, I never really quite understand why he doesn't do the other, the other bit, um, which would explain much more um, how um, Agrippina um, could hold, uh, could have such a hold on him, because they are both, they were, they were both feed, feed off each other's viciousness. Um, whereas in the Robert Gray's version, you know. Yeah, yeah, you just don't understand how Claudius puts up with this. So um, no, um, I'm uh, I, I, I'm on the side of Agrippina being really rather uh, rather a vicious person, and uh, I think it's borne out. I don't think it's just I don't think it's just propaganda from Suetonius. So following that, then how did you sort of decide how to portray Vespasian? Vespasian, I just, I, I, I took him as, as a, a very straightforward man of the land, farming person who has no wish to go to Rome. And then when he sees Rome for the first time, is completely seduced by her and the idea of it. And then as he learns about how the Republic morphed into the empire and how... Um, how the rights of um, people, uh, who, the, the men who used to serve in the army, because they had a stake in the republic, because they had land in the republic, and they needed to, um, and they needed to protect that land. And as the army then fought for further and further, farther and farther afield, and they were away for longer, and they came back, and the farms were overgrown, and they were pushed off, and then the big landowners started to buy up all these lands and you had then these men would move to Rome, they'd have nothing there and then Marius uh, introduced, introduced the, uh, the, the army, the, the professional army in 105 BC and then you'd serve for 25 years and then so the grandchildren of the people who used to fight for the Republic because they had a stake in it now fought for uh, the, what was coming into civil war and then starting to fight for the generals uh, in order to get their stake back. And Vespasian sees that and he understands that he's got to try and keep, um, you know, he, has, he, 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 he believes that uh, he, he needs to fight for that Rome, uh, to keep Rome still progressing. He loves the idea of Rome. Um, and yes, we have the empire. Yes, um, the Republic is a... Um, is, a, is, is a forgotten thing, but he sort of looks back on it and thinks, well, that was quite good, and what we're doing now 
isn't so good yet he has to work with um uh, within you know caligula's law well of tiberius first and caligula uh and he understands how the whole thing works and he becomes very very good at politics because he's a sensible straightforward man who understands land administration from a very early age and he puts that into his the way he manages to uh navigate his way through the empire so he has a great sense of humor which i try and bring out all the time uh and as i say practical sense and a sense of history um so that's that's how i that's how i yeah those are the three main ingredients i decided to put into him and uh, do you think modern readers uh draw parallels to modern situations or is that not to be said? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I mean, the thing about history is it, I always find it, yeah, you, you, you can keep on saying, oh, it was ever thus. <laughs> you know, things always happen. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah repeat, 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 you know. It's, uh, I mean, it's like in the, in, in the Magnus short stories, there's six of them. And, you know, um, you know one of them is about um, uh, child trafficking. Uh, another one is about fixing horse races or chariot races. Another one, you know, Magnus goes into property development at one point. He goes into arms smuggling. You know, stuff that you know uh, that, that's always that's always around. So I always do, you know, I, I do the ancient um, ancient Roman equivalent of of modern stories. Um, so y yes, I mean, and I, you know, I often I often um, find myself, uh, um, you know saying something that is i mean like just recently i i, I found myself saying it, it uh, having a character say yes but we'll we'll tell the people this it's always useful to have alternative facts <laughs> you know that's, yeah, so, so what's the name uh, you know trump's um, uh, hideous witch um you know and whatever you know. yeah it's it's i mean it was that's been going on for, for, for since since we could all reason I guess sometimes you look at modern situations, you think maybe it's best just to live in the first world, AT. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we, 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 the only difference is we've got the internet and cars. <laughs> yeah. Combustion engines. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Classical Wisdom Society members can listen to the entire podcast with Robert Fabry at classicalwisdom.com. You can buy his best-selling Vespasian series on Amazon, and you can also learn more about Robert and his books at www.robertfabry.com.